Hello again. It's been a long while, and I do apologize for that. It's been hectic as of late. So many things happening, so little time to take care of it all. But I do hope you enjoy what I've brought to you today. And to you, the author of this story, Tristan Gents, I do apologize for the long wait. I do hope you can understand. And I do plan on continuing the finale of your story when you get that out. As always, I hope you enjoy the story. I'm a park ranger. I am stuck in the back rooms. Part 2. Slowly we made our way forward into this endless maintenance tunnel. Every pipe dripped, making pools of stagnant water on the ground. I don't like this, Tess whispered to me. Me neither. It's too quiet, I answered as we continued to move forward. Dad, look, there's another tunnel up ahead to our right. I looked at the tunnel she pointed at. Unlike the daily lit one we found ourselves in, this one was drenched in pitch blackness. Let's stick to the one we're in for now. At least we can see here. Tess nodded in agreement with my statement. We slowly proceeded forward when Tess stopped. Dad, do you hear that? She said as she squinted into the gloom up ahead of us. What the hell is that? She said in a quivering whisper. That's when I heard it. A cross between a low guttural moan and a growl. I squinted my eyes staring deeper into the gloomy tunnel ahead of us. My eyes caught sight of something about 30 or 40 yards away. I could only describe what my eyes focused on as a mutilated corpse limpsing out of the darkness of another side hallway towards us. It was awful. The corpse looked as if its skin was molding and stretched over its frame. It honestly looked like the body of a drowning victim after months of bloating and exposure. But it most certainly didn't move like one. We turned to go back the way we came, only to see something out of a horror story. A creature on all fours was slowly approaching from behind. It was the size of a large dog, or maybe even a wolf. It was almost completely skeletal. Two wide eyes stared back at us under a head of long, unsettling human-like black hair. It honestly reminded me a bit of the Wendigo tales I've heard about. This way! Tess yelled as she took off. I followed close behind her. The corpse was limping, but the dog thing was running and gaining on us rapidly. I followed her down another hallway, branching left. Just then the corpse let out the most ear-ringing shriek I've ever heard. We kept sprinting, but I could clearly hear the dog had caught up. I start to look behind me just as Tess screamed at a warning, but it was too late. The dog thing leapt on my back, knocking me to the ground. I managed to spin and face the dog before my back made contact up with the concrete. I grabbed it by the lower and upper jaw, trying my hardest to prevent this thing from tearing my throat out. I heard a loud crack as my eye caught the glint of my daughter's machete. This thing let out a sharp yelp as I rolled it off of me. Just then, another horrible shriek rang my ears, letting us know the corpse had closed the distance between us. She just managed to yank me to my feet before the corpse was upon us. It was only 30 seconds of running before we heard another shriek ahead of us. The darkness seemed to absorb the ambient light, so it only seemed to make what stepped into one of those lights ahead of them more ominous. Another bloated corpse, just as horrid as the first, bellowing in pure bloodlust. 
Suddenly someone appeared, swimming out of nowhere from behind a couple of vertical pipes. They yelled, In here! Hurry! Begging us to follow. Not wasting a second, Tess dove between the narrow gap in the pipes. Sadly, I'm not as small as my daughter and sitting in a tower all day. You're gonna put on some weights. I got slightly stuck in the narrow gap. I just managed to free, free myself as I realized the last second my daughter dropped from her machete. I looked back to see it sh sitting in the sheath just on the other side of the pipes on the ground. Not wasting a second, I quickly reached through and snatched it and pulled my arm back just as a pair of jaws chomped down where my hand had just been. I shoved it back in my pack and quickly got up. The man who had saved us quickly mentioned, we need to move since the pipes won't hold them back for long. That was the first time I got a look of our savior. He was wearing a black hoodie with a painted blue mask with a f black frowning face and blue jeans and carried a solid looking piece of pipe in the right hand. To prove his point, the ear splitting sound of tearing metal rang out from behind us. I turned to see two more of the dog things tearing into the pipes and making quick work of it. Jesus, if they can do that to metal, what would have it done to me? I asked myself. The man turned and yelled, Trust me, you don't want to know. Now, this way, move. Getting up quickly, Tess quick asked me, Dad, are you sure we can trust him? I grabbed her arm and started to guide her in the direction the man was urging us. I'd rather take my chances with him than with them, replied. She looked back just as another horrible sound of ripping metal assaulted her ears. The dogs were through the metal and the corpses were right behind them leaving a vast amount of metal pipe debris on the floor. We took off after the man as we made our way down the corridor, which eventually led us to a T-junction. Tess and I watched as another of these dog things emerged from the right and blocked our way. Tess yelled, What the f- but was interrupted by a horrible chorus of howls and screeches from behind us. The things were gaining fast. The man ran past us and now assumed dead abominations, and turned left at the junction, and Tess and I followed. At the end of the tunnel was the first door we'd seen throughout this entire tunnel facility. I noticed there was another person, who appeared to be female, standing in the doorway. The same black hooded figure and mask as the man. She was screaming at us to hurry. All done without breaking his stride, the man bolted through, followed by Tess and I, just as we crossed the doorway's threshold. The lady urgently moved us to close the door, but not before a bloated arm got in the gap. The man ran over and tried to force the door closed. The man turns to me and said, You have a gun! Use it, goddammit! As if on cue, three more rotting and bloated arms popped through the gap of the door, trying to force it open. This finally snapped Tess and I out of our paralysis, and we raised our firearms. And with either a scream of rage or desperation, completely unloaded our guns on the morbid appendages reaching for us. The arms were reduced to stumps as groans of rage erupted from the opposite end of the door. With a solid clank, the door slammed closed on the nav ragged stumps. The woman slammed a large deadbolt into place, then slid a metal chair she found in the room under the doorknob. There was a solid boom as the door shuddered under a brutal impact. Everyone just stood and stared in horror as another huge boom shook the room. I watched as dust fell from the ceiling, then another boom. Dad! Tess screamed as she pointed my attention back to the door. My blood went cold as another boom shook the room. The door was starting to give, a bulge now protruding from its center. Another boom as more dust fell. Come on, everyone, let's go, the man yelled. This snapped me out of my trance as I turned around and noticed the man holding open a hatch in the ground. The woman yelled, Are you insane? Do you know where that goes? You got a better idea? We're stuck in here and it's either take our chances with this thing or deal with that, he snapped back while pointing at the door. As if on cue, another boom rocked the room. 
Tess and I watched in horror as cracks formed in on the door around the ever-growing bulge protruding from its center. Tess, get down the hatch now, I screamed as I moved to follow her. Tess dashed over it and down the hatch, followed by myself, then the woman, and the last thing they heard was the horrible screech of tearing metal right before the man slammed the hatch closed after climbing in himself. After descending the ladder, we found ourselves in a bright room, the light glaring as opposed to the dim aspect of the place they just escaped from. After my eyes adjusted, we found ourselves in a child's party room. Bright, colorful wallpaper lined the walls and two tables, sat complete with white tablecloths. Party hats with polka dots and kazoos lined the tables. On one sat a white cake with pink sprinkles. Three candles sat unlit in the frosting, a couple of cups sat on the other side with what appeared to be red juice. Tess let out a short gasp. Thank God, I'm parched. She ran to the cup and quickly scooped it up. Just as she was about to sip it, the man out of nowhere smacked the cup out of her hand while screaming, Don't! The cup crashed to the ground and some of it splashed on Tess's arm. What happened next, I wasn't ready for. The only thing I can relate the sound that resonated from my daughter's mouth was... Murder. Bloody murder. It sounded like someone had set my daughter on fire. She screamed in pure, undeniable pain and agony, tears streaming down her face. Before I could fully contemplate what I had just watched, my fatherly instincts took over, and my body moved before my mind could react. I flew across the room and shoved the man so hard I had sent him flying backwards over the table. He crashed into the wall, hitting his head and knocking him out. What did you do to her? I yelled as I went to check Tess. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a violent person by any means. While I have around 15 years in various competitive martial arts, it's always been strictly for fitness and self-defense alone. However, no one hurts my daughter. Dad, it hurts. It feels like my arm is melting. The woman ran over to help her friend. It's okay, baby. Will you be okay for a second? I gotta take care of something. I asked Tess. The pain is beating, so I, I think I'll be okay, she replied. With that, I stood up and started making my way around the table. Before I got to him, the lady suddenly turned around and violently shoved back, sending me tumbling over a chair onto the ground. The lady screamed at me in anger. What the hell is wrong with you? You saved her life! Slowly getting up, I quickly swallowed my aggression and went back to comfort Tess. What do you mean he saved her? I asked while narrowing my eyes in suspicion. Look, I am sorry for shoving you, but I refuse to let you hurt him, she began. That's not juice she was about to drink. It's something the rest of us call liquid pain. If she had ingested it, the outcome would have been far worse. She would have died hours after feeling like her insides are melting. Some of it splashed on her arm, and you saw what it did. The lady finished. This made me look back at my daughter. Her arm was now blistering with the liquid that had splashed on it. I looked back at the lady. Although she was wearing a mask, I could tell by her posture that she was relaxed. I'm sorry for shoving him. I acted before I could think. She's all that I have left. I know first aid and CPR. Is he okay? I asked. The lady then glanced back at her now unconscious friend. He's breathing, so he should be okay. I appreciate the gesture. There was a couple of moments of silence before I spoke again. You said the rest of us? Tess asked. Yes. There is more of us, but we have a base further into this level, she replied. The lady took off her backpack and made her way over to us. 
She pulled out a white plastic bottle with the label reading almond water across the front. She proceeded to slowly pour it onto Tessa's forearm. I watched in amazement as a blister seemed to fizzle on her skin and then fade into a scar. Here, drink this. The lady then handed the bottle to Tess, which she accepted. Almonds? Water? I asked incredulously. The lady handed me a bottle. Don't worry, we got tons. There was a moan and we turned around to see her friend coming too. The lady sighed. I know you have a lot of questions, but right now we aren't in a safe place. I'll answer all your questions when we get back to our safe camp. I slowly helped Tess to her feet, her tears having already dried. Tess turned to the lady. Thank you for that, Tess said. It's no problem. However, we do need to get moving. We don't want to be here for long, the lady said as she helped the man to his feet. I turned to the lady. We should take a second for your friend to recover before we move. There's nothing after us at the moment, so we're safer here. Especially in comparison to where we just came from. I'm sorry for shoving you, I said to the man. I wasn't thinking. I'm so sorry, I apologized. Trust me, I've had worse, he replied. The lady threw the guy's arm over her shoulder to begin helping as walk. Trust me when I say this. We're not safe. This place is far worse. There's something here that we definitely don't want to encounter that would do things to us that pale in comparison to the things back there. With your screaming earlier, there's not a doubt in my mind that they heard us and are on their way. So we need to move. I handed Tess her machete back. Thanks for going back to save this earlier, she said. Of course, I had to save it. I couldn't just let you lose it. I gave that to you when you joined my park as a ranger. My daughter gave me a tight hug. We got our kids sorted out and started running together. Tess and I followed the lady and the man who was now running on his own. We took a left, then a right, and another left. It's all party room. Every single room had balloons and cake. Some rooms were massive with dozens of party tables, all decorated the same way, with balloons and streamers as far as our eyes could see. We'd been running for about half an hour before some movement caught my eye off in one of the side halls. Wait, I just saw someone. They may need help. I said to the group. The lady turned around and before she could comment on what a stupid idea it was to stop moving, I called out, Hey! Are you okay? Do you need any medical attention? You just killed us all, the lady said. There was no emotion in her voice, just a matter of fact tone to it. Before I could ask her what she meant, I received my answer. A tall, yellow humanoid figure stepped out from the end of the side hall, and time seemed to stop. I took in the ungodly sight in front of me. It was tall, easily seven or eight feet. It looked like one of those wacky, inflatable flaving tube men you always see outside of used car dealerships. This was worse, though. So much worse. It walked on two feet and definitely wasn't inflatable. It held a string with a red balloon in one of his hands. The worst part was the wounds carved into what appeared to be yellow flesh at the top of his head. No eyes, just crude, deep, bleeding cuts carved into the shape of a smiley face. I felt a tight grip on my shoulder yank me around. Move! It was the man. I realized just then I had been paralyzed like a deer in the headlights. I hadn't realized the thing had started approaching. The man shoved me in the direction where we had been initially heading. As I willed my legs to life, 
one foot, then another. Finally, I was running with the lady and Tess, with the man following close behind me. After about 30 seconds, I looked back and realized we had a lead on the thing that was rapidly growing in size. The thing was just walking, not running or sprinting, just walking. Guys, wait, it's only walking, we can slow down a bit, I said. Before I could begin to slow my pace, the guy behind me put his hand on my back and urged me to go faster. We can't stop, it's not that we just saw one, it's that where there's one, there's always more. As if to puncture his point, there were more that appeared right around the rooms ahead of us. Trap, go left! The lady yelled back, and she took a hard left down another hallway. Do you know where we're going? Tess yelled, the sounds of our feet slamming against the floor. Either to answer the question or out of joy's relief, the lady exclaimed, Yes! Just as she skidded to a hard stop in front of a doorway, Tess and I peered over the lady's shoulder, and our eyes rested on what should have been a comforting nostalgia trip. But due to our immediate circumstances at the time, none of us were feeling nostalgic. A large indoor park about three stories tall sat in the middle of a gymnasium-sized room. A massive ball pit lined the entire floor with a maze tube style of tunnels of every color mashed together to make a rainbow-colored fortress for children. Above the door frame in large letters read, Kids Fun Zone. The lady broke into a sprint while yelling back, Quickly, follow me! Not wasting a second, we broke into a sprint after her. To make things far worse, two of those horrid yellow things seemed to slowly rise out of the ball pit. She led us around the fortress to the opposite end and pointed at a yellow tube slide which wrapped up in a spiral up around a support beam to the second story of the playground. It may have actually been fun to slide down into the ball pit if we weren't being chased. Wait, isn't there another way up? How are we supposed to get up the slide with our gear and bags? Tess asked. Before anyone could answer, another one of those yellow creatures emerged out of the ball pit, standing right behind Tess. It grabbed her by her backpack and with an unsettling amount of ease, picked her up with one hand, dangling her like a doll about one foot off the ground. Tess! I screamed as I dragged my legs towards her as fast as I could. With impressive speed, she drew her machete and cut her handle strap dropping herself to the ground and rushed to the slide entrance. As if she angered it, it let out a low guttural growl, and two popped up out of the ball pit next to it. Get to the slide now, the man yelled. The thing that had grabbed Tess threw the bag at us, landing about four feet from the slide's exit. Tess sheathed her machete and bolted up the slide, pressing her back against the top while crawling on all fours to keep her grip. Tess was followed by the lady, then me. After struggling and making it halfway up, the slide, I had noticed something had made my heart stop. The man, he wasn't behind me. A loud boom echoed through the room, leaving my ears ringing. I felt all the blood drain from my face. I know Tess and the lady are already up there, but the guy should have been right behind me. Tess had her shotgun strapped to her backpack. I realized what was happening in horror as Tess and the lady pulled me up from the mouth of the slide. At the top of the slide was an elevated room five feet tall, forcing us to crouch. Screened mesh formed black plastic see-through walls that gave us an uninterrupted view of what was happening. The man had gone back for the gun. What are you doing? The lady screamed. Get to the hatch. If I don't stall them, they'll follow you, the man said. Please, we can all get to the hatch! The lady yelled to him through the mask with audible sobs. I'm sorry, but we both know they'll follow you up there. Someone needs to distract them and buy you time. Go! The man yelled back. God damn it! I hate you so much right now! The lady screamed between her heavy sobs. The man had his attention on the horrid yellow figures approaching him as he fired another shot. I love you too. I'm sorry. I have to make sure you make it. I'll always be watching over you. Now get your ass moving! The man glanced back over his shoulder and for the first time lifted his mask. He was young, 
Maybe no more than a few years older than Tess. Tears freely flowed down his cheeks. Go! He screamed. He then turned his attention back to the monstrosities. Then there was a sound that filled my heart with sorrow. Click. He had emptied the rest of the shells and the shotgun into these things. Two of them lay on the ground with holes in their heads. Shit! The man yelled. He then withdrew his pipe he had used to whack the dogs earlier. Run! The man screamed again with more desperation in his voice as he swung the closest monster to him. I raised my rifle and took aim at the things when a hand rested at the top of my rifle, lowering it back to the ground. The lady then placed her hand on my shoulder and between sobs she said, Let's go! As I took one last glance to the man, he was fighting wildly, swinging at the things ferociously as the others were getting back up. They were slowly surrounding him. With regret in my heart, I turned away and followed the lady. She took me through another red tunnel at the opposite end of the room. It went straight for about 20 feet with a passage to the right. We crawled through and stood up in a small hallway, like area that had a ramp made of elastic-like mesh going up at a 45 degree angle for about 15 feet, ending at an apparent third floor of this playground. A terrible scream of pained agony echoed through the room. We all knew what that meant. However, none of us had to point it out, as yellow figures slowly moved into view, drenched in blood and staring at us from the side passage of the red tunnel. We watched in horror as the thing approached us, and another appeared at the end of the tunnel behind it. The first was approaching us with surprising speed. We scrambled up the incline as fast as we could, and by the time I got up and onto the third floor, the first monster had already exited the tunnel and was making its way up the incline as the second was emerging behind him. I quickly drew my rifle and shot the first one in the head. I watched as the creature dropped back and fell down the incline, smashing into the one behind it. The second one was slowly standing back up at the bottom. Although it had lacked eyes, I could feel it staring daggers at me through the horrible wounds. Quick, we need to go. It won't take long for it to get up here, the lady said as she guided Tess to a ladder. The corner of the small room, I followed it into the ladder as the lady quickly climbed in with Tess right behind her. The lady reached up the hatch at the top, opened it, and climbed up as Tess followed her. I started to follow them, then I heard a noise. I looked behind me and I saw one of those horrible faces appear from the incline. I raised up the ladder and slammed the hatch closed behind me. After my eyes adjusted to the light difference in this place, I realized I was back in those underground maintenance tunnels. However, there was a stark difference from before. People. All around us were people sitting around fires and sleeping in tents. A large stack of boxes sitting in the corner of this area. All the people wore black sweaters and had those blue frowning masks. Another man wearing the same attire approached us and immediately wrapped the lady in a tight embrace. I'm so glad you're okay, he said in a cheerful tone. Where's Michael? He asked her after glancing at Tess and me. The lady broke down, sobbing again. He didn't make it, she sobbed. The man lifted his mask. Shock and sorrow clearly lined his elderly face. He wrapped her in a tight hug again, whispering, I am so sorry, honey, in her ear. You go get something to eat. I'll be right over to join you shortly. The man finished. Another person with a mask came up and started guiding the crying lady away. The man turned to my daughter and I as he spoke. You don't need to worry. You're safe now. There's nothing here that can hurt you, he said, as he extended his hand to me. After a second, I took it and shook. Who are you guys, and where in the hell are we? I 
asked him. He smiled and replied, We are the party poopers. Welcome to our home base. Well, that took a turn. So much for a hopeful reunion. Now there is a member of their party lost that we had only recently met. Such a shame. I was starting to grow a liking to that guy. Maybe it was worth those rounds from that rifle to save him. But who can say? A valiant ending for them. And I'm curious what the next part's going to bring. As always, I wish to thank you all for being here, and I hope you've enjoyed. And I do wish you a fantastic rest of your day, night, evening, afternoon, morning, whatever day or time of day it is for you. And do remember, there's so much for us to learn in this world. Ha 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 